Welcome, good evening. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here on a Tuesday night. We're excited to have you out here. And this is Fighting the Darkness. This is a, a kind of a panel discussion on suicide. Um, I don't know if you guys know that September is Suicide Awareness Month. And so we want to have that conversation. Everybody up here on the panel, if you got one of the little handouts, kind of gives you everybody's bio, is connected in one way or another, either to helping people that are struggling with suicide, maybe lost survivor, attempt survivor. We have pastor. So we have different people with different experiences. I myself in 2005 lost my brother uh, to suicide. So it's something that I've walked through. And I think all of us, if we think about it, are pretty close to somebody that's either went through a struggle with it or attempted, or maybe we've lost somebody in our lives. I, I think it, it touches all of us in many ways. And Tina, I don't mean to stand in front of you and have you looking at my back. So, um, but we're gonna take just a few minutes and what I would love to do, everybody's got a microphone. I'd love all of our panelists to just kind of introduce yourself, why you're here, what you're doing, and then we'll kind of open it up to, uh, to get this going tonight. And we'll start with lovely Tina. My name, my name is Tina Spellman, and I've I'm here kind of representing the pastor on the on the panel. I've been pastoring for 32 years, so I've been around the mountain a few times. But I'm also the principal of a Christian school, so I deal with teenagers and middle school, high school students, and little kids every day. And um, the struggles start in kindergarten. It is. It is um, amazing, the mental health issues that exist today, especially in the classroom. Um, so, yeah, I'm just happy to be here tonight. Hi, my name is Vicki D'Amico. I am an SOS survivor. I lost my son 11 years ago to suicide. He was 22 years old. Uh, my goal is to bring awareness to the, our community. I live in Cherokee County, and I uh, want to bring awareness to Suicide. I'm Morgan Pickering and I'm here representing first responders but what is unique about my experience is that not only am I first a first responder but I'm a peer and a suicide attempt survivor myself um, so what I bring to the table is perspectives on both sides of, of crisis both as someone who's experienced and been responded to in crisis but also responded to others in crisis Hello, my name is April Bailey. I am a therapist. Um, so I have been in private practice a couple years, um, but doing therapy 17 years. And then for maybe five years or more of that time, um, I also was a on-call crisis counselor. So if somebody was having suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts or like psychosis, um, I would go out to the hospitals or the jails or wherever the folks were at and kind of um, assess for safety and figure out the, the best kind of thing for them, how to keep them safe. Is, is this close to Yeah. I hate the phones. Uh, my name is Heather and I am Green Phoenix. I'm the one that organized this event. Uh, this is our fourth year doing it. I also am an attempt survivor at a peer, and a big part of the reason that I put the panel together the way that I did is generally the only voice that you hear is the voice of the lost survivor and occasionally from the crisis people. But you rarely hear from the first responders or the church and even less so from attempt survivors. And these are all stories that are important and the goal of tonight is to answer questions and have a dialogue with you, the audience. Uh, there are index cards on the table with a pen back there if you're not comfortable speaking. You can write out the question and then give it to the weird guy in the hat. Yeah, you're the only one in the hat, so well, not, not that guy, that guy. <laughs> I think she just called you weird. I'm sorry. I didn't even notice you. I'm sorry. I know I got my son. Yeah. Look yeah. at this, Heather. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Good night. Um, but in all seriousness, we really want to engage in a conversation, answer questions that you have, and make this a topic that is more 
natural to talk about because there's no reason for the fear and the stigma and the other fun words that come along with it. So um, I'll give you the mic back. You can give it to me. All right. So you get kind of the idea. This is meant to be kind of an open discussion, open forum. You've got, you heard everybody's background, and um, you've heard what's going on. I want to put a, a question out there to, um, and I know Tina, you mentioned seeing it in elementary school. Uh, from from this side of things, especially from our professionals, when you're looking at maybe even younger children, what are some of the things that we can look for? in our younger kids to kind of see if they're going down a path that would be along that thought process. Is there something that any of you would, would recommend to us that maybe have kids or are working with kids that we can look for? Some of the um, signs to look for in small children, okay? Small children, let's say maybe the age of 14 and under, they cannot articulate if they've experienced trauma or if they have mental health issues. It usually shows up as a medical issue. Their stomachs always hurt. Maybe they started wet in the bed. Maybe they don't make friends. Maybe they're hypersensitive to certain topics. Um, those are really key signs that there's something going on with them that they're just not able to articulate. And even if you ask them, hey, what's going on? It's still, they're still not equipped to be able to tell you, oh, uh, my, I live in domestic violence or any of that. Now, my personal experience, which we all like to use, um, I grew up in domestic violence. And when I was nine years old, um, I received what was perceived as a bad report card. And I disclosed to my fourth grade teacher, I can't take this home or I'm going to get a beating. Well, my, this was the late 90s, so corporal punishment was still popular, right? So I was accused of not knowing the difference between a spanking and a beating. So a note was sent home to my parents from my teacher disclosing what I had just told them. So if you grew up in the what happens in this house stays in this house, you can understand what happened next. So when I essentially snitched on my parents, I was threatened to be put in the foster care system. So when you have a child that is so overly emotional about something that we would think is normal, that's usually a good sign that there's something else going on. That's good, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think too in like the young, young kiddos, anger, um, so anger shows up, this depression is kind of displayed as anger a lot of times in youth, um, also more so in men than in women. So an angry kiddo, um, extraordinarily shy kiddo, like you said, not necessarily making friends. Um, Starting to turn to substances, those kinds of things. Okay. Anyone else? Have anything else you want to share? Those. I appreciate that. Any questions from anybody out here? Because that's these are the kind of things that we want. I started it out. I threw out the, the the ball. These are the kind of questions that we want to have. Is there anything that's on any of your minds that you'd like to ask our group up here? Yes. Um. Here, we're going to need a microphone to see that. That's my job. April. Uh, April. Yes, you mentioned anger. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe that a little bit? What, when, when we talk about that anger in, in child, what exactly are we looking for? So actually, today I was talking to, so I just work with adults because those kids throw me. <laughs> you know? Um, but I was talking to the mom of a child who, his anger, um, he was throwing things at school. Um, he started lashing out at his mom. Like, so he's, I want to say he was like five or six. So like, couldn't hurt her, but he was like, you know, kind of hitting, flailing, refusing to do things, stomping off. I hate you. Um, and you're not turning in work. But I think a lot of times it might be like throwing things, starting to hit. Um, I know kids have tipped over desks, tried to stab you with a pencil. And those are more kind of, I guess, on the extreme side. But anger could also just be like verbal lashing out, too. And the reason why I ask is 
we want to differentiate from the natural uh, reaction of display of ang anger that is just natural to absolutely yeah. disproportionate yes. anger yes. Re reoccurring pattern anger yeah um, like um, what is like uh, unconsolable rage kind of stuff and where there's a change in that behavior so a new onset of yeah, sure. If there's something like a trauma that's occurred, then yeah, you might see, you know, a well-behaved kid kind of turn to anger. Um, if it's something kind of ongoing, they might just, you know, they showed up in kindergarten and it's bad little Timmy in kindergarten, you know, so they might, they might have these problems from the get-go. Uh, but certainly seeing a change in behavior is a is key to look into things. We encounter in the classroom sometimes defiance to just silly things it's just mm -hmm. there's just a defiance like when one of my middle schoolers today didn't want to sit with the pull-out specialist and just got in my face and why do i have to do that you know but i know what's going on in his world and it's totally he loves me to pieces so it's totally it's just his anger and his stuff comes out in anger you know and so sometimes it's just defiance to things that just are inconsequential you know but they just don't want to do it so, I think one of the other things in my son's case, so when he was young, he was diagnosed with uh, learning disabilities, and there was somewhat, the minute that diagnosis came about, and it came at the school system, there began an introversion in him, and of course anger went along with it, but now in his mind he became a target for people, it, because it's a label. And he didn't want to be labeled. I don't think any of them want to be labeled, but it, it, I think that there's a patterning that goes on. Um, I want to say he was about maybe eight or nine when we started seeing it, and then um, the services kicked in for him. But, and they stayed with him, so he had that stigma all through school. He actually read that, I want to say, in 11th grade, when he got into his senior year was a complete change in him, but it followed him all the way through. Um, one last thing I wanted to add um, with the mention of defiance. Um, we are seeing a surge in oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, and bipolar disorder. These symptoms are diagnostically identical to trauma response in minors. So, unfortunately, not every clinician is trauma-informed, not every clinician specializes in trauma. But, one of the biggest issues we're seeing is that kids are not being screened for trauma before given a diagnosis and medication. So, a lot of the, the defiance and the acting out and the being overly emotional could very well be a trauma response as opposed to ODD or ADHD or even bipolar disorder. ODD was not a thing when I was a kid. <laughs> Although I'm pretty sure if it had been, it would have been slapped on my forehead. But I was misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder at the age of 16 because I'm a prodigy. For those of you who don't know, typically you're not supposed to diagnose anybody with personality disorder under the age of 18. And typically they wait till you're in your 20s and your brain's fully cooked. But hey, like I said, I was a prodigy. I was also misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. So it's interesting to me, and I grew up in a weird scenario. I moved 12 times, so on my 13th birthday, my parents moved to Georgia and said, hey, guess what, we're, we're staying, and actually meant it. And I didn't believe them, and school was hell. I was unmercilessly bullied all the way from kindergarten until, oh, yesterday, basically. Because I still get bullied by my family, and it sucks. And you got to think about this one. It's a lot less tolerated now than it used to be when I was growing up, and I realize that people think that it's worse now. It's different. It's not worse. It's more taunting. It's more online. There's more in. in I can't say anonymity. What, what yeah, he said. That word there, and I can't say it well. Anonymity. Yeah. 
But the reality of it is that when I was growing up, it was a lot more physical abuse, and the, it was girls stuff or stin, don't be such a baby, toughen up, fight back. Whereas now we're starting to recognize that bullying does impact the way that people see themselves. And so if you see somebody that's getting picked on, reach out, stop it, first of all, and try to help the kid that's getting bullied, but don't just stop there, focus on the bully themselves and figure out what the heck is going on in their world. Because people don't do that when they're healthy. And I think a lot of times people forget about that. And can we just agree not to like label people anymore? Because it really kind of sucks. Go ahead, Jack. Staying on that same train of thought, but flipping to the other side, um, you know, now that we talked about like what to look for in small children, what about our peers and things like that? What are some key things to look for in adults? Because I know some of it's going to be the same, but at the same time, it's going to look very different. So I like to use the example of the angry coworker because I was that person. The angry coworker is not, they don't just wake up and just decide to be a miserable person that day. It's a series of events. Um, so the person who makes work just an absolute living hell, um, there's a reason for that, and projection is real. Um, I talk about projection all the time and how people treat you says more about what they have going on than really with us, especially when you've done good to that person and they still just lash out at you. Um, but like we mentioned earlier, anger is very much a superficial emotion. There is always something under anger. Um, anger is just what we show the world when we're absolutely overwhelmed. Um, but for our peers, specifically that angry, miserable person, um, I, I, would, I would be bold enough to say that you can't always fix a miserable person. It has to come within. Um, but boundaries are essential with people who they haven't done the work. And maybe they're not ready, and that's not wrong, but it does get draining. And for those of us who, or those who support us, I say us because I was that person, um, it can be, it can create trauma in that person to have to deal with someone who has unresolved trauma. Um, but also acting out. So I went through a period of time where I lived my life like a trashy reality TV show and I invited everybody to a front row seat. Because when you go through trauma and it's unresolved, we, we seek attention, okay? But we want quick attention, but quick attention is never healthy. But we're so addicted to that cycle that we, it takes a long time to learn that lesson. And so um, the person who's out showing half naked pictures of themselves online, they have some unresolved issues. The people that are posting online, like talking about how big and bad they are, why do we need to know how big and bad you are? What are you invalidated on? There's always a reason behind someone's abrupt actions, and it's usually, not always, but usually trauma induced. So if you look in the program, I'm, I'm really proud of this. I worked really hard on it. And this year, we put in the, some of the warning signs. It's in the second to last page. There's also little cards on the resource table that you are all welcome and please take them that have some of the warning signs. As someone who has not only attempted multiple times, but has been fairly recently struggling with gray suicidality, and for those of you who are not familiar with that term, it means that the thoughts are there, but the intent is not. And it's not a fun place to be. But some of the things, because I know the statistics, and I know the warning signs, and it's really scary when you see them in yourself. It's that tendency to want to isolate. It's that tendency to, or you want to be the life of the party because you don't want people to know that there's something going on. So anytime you see a dramatic shift in the way that the person is acting, that is something to be concerned about. And one of the things I, a lot of people don't realize, if you see someone who's been really struggling for a long time and has been like just isolating and then all of a sudden they show up and they start telling you that they love you or they start giving things away, and if they all of a sudden seem to have this peace, 
It's because they've made a decision and they're going to follow through with it. And I know because I've been there. And thankfully, the last time I got there, there were some amazing people who wouldn't leave me alone as much as I asked them to. Yeah, I was going to add that too. I think that's well said. Um, it is the miserable, angry coworker, but it's also, you know, it's it's the dutiful coworker too, who is excuse me, quiet and smiling and you know helpful, and they show up and they do their thing and they kind of keep their head down and they go to work and. Maybe they're even going out for drinks with you after work and they're smiling and they're laughing and they go home and they're exhausted and that took all of the energy that they had. Um, maybe they're not going home with you because they just are isolating. At, I'm sorry, maybe they're not going, they're probably not going home with you, but out to drinks with you um, because they're just isolating. Um, and and uh, Heather, you made a good point too that when when somebody who is has that big change, when they're you know they're miserable, or maybe they're just fine and polite, but all of a sudden now they like they have this peace, like you mentioned, this kind of sense of relief. They're giving things away. Um, that can be a sign too that the end is is near. You know, they've made their decision. They're about to attend. So I think. And hearing all of this, I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is when you hear of the big personality shifts or the anger or some of those things that are going out, for those of us that are maybe close enough that we notice those changes, um, or we just we see somebody that's acting out in that way, rather than getting frustrated with them or talking to somebody else about them and saying, well, you know what? that person's just a jerk and they're always mean and they're always angry. One of the things that we can do to help kind of bypass some of this stuff is actually get to know the person. Spend time with them, find out what's going on. Um, rather than just accusing or pushing away, kind of, hey, can we go grab lunch sometime and just maybe hear their story? Or talk to them, not go fishing for, hey, what's going on? You're a jerk, why are you like this? Nothing like that, but but to really sit down and, and get to know somebody because they're acting out that way because they don't know how to deal with what's inside. It's either coming out with how they're responding to people or kind of that masking, that shielding, but it takes somebody actually getting to know them to actually be able to walk with them through whatever they're going through. So. I just want to add one other thing. I have been labeled as attention seeking before. And in fact, the night before my last attempt, I went to the local crisis center and I was very distraught. I didn't know, but I knew in my heart that T Bone, my pup, had passed. And when I got there, it busted the door. And the first guy came out, and he could tell something was going on, he could tell there was something wrong. And for those of you who know me well, you know that when I get really stressed, I become nonverbal. And that night, I could not articulate a word. It, it, the stuttering was so bad that I literally could not form words. And he was trying to get me to come inside and talk to me and figure out what was going on. And then his coworker came out, and um, we made oil and water look compatible. She sent him inside turned around, looked at me, and said, go away, we don't have time for your games tonight. And I went home, and I crawled into bed. And the only reason I know I fell asleep is because the phone call the next morning from the vet woke me up. He told me that he wanted to pass sometime in the night and offered to let me come to the office so I could say goodbye. It was a Sunday. But he still let me come by the office, and he I already had him wrapped in his death shroud, and I held him, wrapped him in his baby blanket, and I cried until I had nothing left. And then that's when I felt that peace, because I knew what I was gonna do. I handed over his body, asked him to face cremate him with the blanket, 
Then I went home, and I took a bottle of Klonopin and half a bottle of Fluxrol and a random beer that just happened to be in my refrigerator, and chugged as much of it as I could tolerate because I hate beer. And then I left my phone on the table, went downstairs, got in my car, and I was going to go to the river trail where we used to hike and jump in the river and lock my keys and wallet in the car, but at the last minute I ended up going to PetSmart. And the manager figured out what something was up. She didn't know what was going on, but she knew something was up. And so she had her employee call 911 while she came out to talk to me. Now, in my mind, I was perfectly coherent. As I handed over my keys and my wallet and said, can you please clean out my apartment, sell my stuff, pay off any outstanding bills, and then donate the rest to the main society. Apparently, what actually happened is I garbled a few words and then passed out. I spent the next two days in the ICU on a ventilator. Vaguely remember waking up in restraints and trying to pull my hand out of them. And the really sad irony is, had I simply spoke to the psychiatrist at the hospital, they would have sent me home that night. The, the night that I woke up, and they were instead they sent me to a psych hospital. And I spent about a week there, and they're like, okay, you're good, go away. And then a couple weeks later, I ended up back there because I hadn't slept. By the time I got to the hospital, it had been 44 hours straight. See, I, I keep telling everybody, sleep's really not that important. I was there for less than 24 hours, the patient advocate and I became very good friends. And then I managed to stay out for about a month. And then I ended up back in the hospital again. And that was when I really started to recognize that I needed help. So when the hold was up, I signed myself in. But then I got scared. And I tried to tell them that I wasn't ready to discharge, but they still let me discharge against medical advice. And then about um, two or three weeks later, I ended up in there again after having a, a psychotic break. And then that was the last time until the anniversary of my dad's passing that I was hospitalized. But I'm, I'm telling you this because I did ask for help. But because people saw it as attention seeking because I had a history of cutting. I had a history of suicidal thoughts, and because I had enough labels to wallpaper this entire room of misdiagnoses, and the stigma that went along with each of those misdiagnoses, especially borderline personality disorder, I was turned away. So if somebody comes up to you and they tell you that they're struggling, or that they're thinking about ending their life or any of that, take it seriously. I don't care if it's the first time or the millionth time. Every time should be taken seriously because I shouldn't be here, but I am. I just wanted to piggyback on what Larry said and then Heather just made it clear that um, relationship and the willingness to have relationship with somebody is, is a key factor just in how we live our lives with other people. You know, for me, it's a mandate from God to love others. So, you know, but that's messy and it's time consuming and rarely is it convenient. When I leave here tonight, I have to go to the hospital to a friend who, who called right before they started and wants a hamburger, you know, my husband's coming nine o'clock, you know. But she struggles with mental health issues, with physical health issues. And I know what she really needs is she just needs me to come by there, right? And I'm tired. I started my day at 5.15 this morning. But guess where I'm going when I leave here? I'm going to go to the hospital. Because it matters. And I'm not saying that you wear yourself out. That's not what I'm saying. But, but I'm just saying it matters. And being willing to just take the time to get down in the trench with somebody, that's what's going to change the world. It's not, you know, it's not our degrees. It's not our qualifications. It's none of that thing. It's just simply being willing to love another human being and for who they are and where they're at. And, you know, it's, Heather makes jokes about, you know, casting the mental health demon out, which is what the church tries to do. <laughs> Unfortunately, it, the, the awareness, mental health awareness is getting better in the church world, but, but at the bottom of it all is just the willingness to love somebody and just being willing to, to get messy and with them and 
take the time because it's rarely convenient, but being willing, I think, is is a, a key part of it. Students come in my office all the time, and probably eight out of ten of my students have trauma of some kind. And even even the younger ones, I have one second grader right now who's experiencing extreme trauma. And so, you know, they'll come to my office and they just want to sit and talk. They just want to sit down and talk. And of course, that interrupts all of the stuff I'm supposed to be getting done for the day, you know. But sometimes, most of the time, I'll just close my computer. Which one talking about? And we just sit and talk. And that's what they want to do. They just want to sit and talk. They just want to know that somebody cares, that somebody sees them, and that, that they matter. We all want to know that, you know. And I think if we would take the time to do that more often, we would have fewer people who find themselves at that age. Cool. Yeah, I have a question about that is um, a lot of times I had a counselor, I had a, my best friend struggled with it a lot and he would go to the counselor like every day um, until like one day that counselor just like was fed up with it and mm -hmm. I just, I have, that's what I, I'm curious about is when the other person kind of gets tired of their trauma and it starts like I, that can push you over the edge too. Is knowing that you know someone is kind of annoyed at me now, but I'm, I'm talking about my trauma all the time, and I don't know. <laughs> well, that was a bad counselor. <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh my gosh, bad guys. counselor. <laughs> um, I like hearing your story, Heather. I hate. I hate that you went through that. Me too. I hate that you went through that. Your friend went through that. I don't disbelieve it at all. Um, you know, I went, when I was doing the crisis work and I'd show up at the hospitals, I'd see that all the time. And I think a lot of it is burnout, burnt out nurses, burnt out doctors, trying to get you know the next head in the bed or the next kid out the door, whatever it is. Um, I think it kind of speaks to something that you had said earlier where like that's about them it's not about you it's hard not to you know think that it's not when you're coming there for your issues and then you kind of get attacked for the very thing you're there for um i you know i if that I would go somewhere else. Like if, if you know, where at all possible, because again, like when I walk into the hospitals, the nurses would be like, oh, bed number eight, this person, attention seeking, you know, this label, that label. Um, and sometimes they would, the, the patient would get up and walk out before I would even get there because of that kind of treatment and I don't blame them. But um, if you, that's not everybody, and I guess there are other resources out there too, and so if you're not getting it from the school counselor or the hospital, for heaven's sakes, where you should get these things, like, please don't give up. Please try other places um, and other people. Um, I have a little slightly different perspective to the, you know, showing up and, you know, being a listening ear and such. I personally, just me personally, me personally, I don't always want to talk, you know? Um, when we're down and out, our responsibilities pile up. So when someone's like, oh, if you need anything, I'll be a listening ear. I don't need a listening ear. I need someone to come do my dishes. I need someone to work a shift for me. I need someone to come help me with laundry. I need someone to pick up my kids or take them for a weekend. That's what I need. And unfortunately, I have not been privy to that uh, luxury. Um, so I've had to figure it out on my own. But something that you were sharing about your experience, I'm also a suicide attempt survivor. And I attempted similarly uh, to what you shared. And again, my perspective is different because I'm also a first responder, but I've been responded to in crisis. And I had the police show up at my house. Um, I had also attempted with medication. And my cry for help was calling my primary care physician. I was like, how many more of these can I take till I die? And they were like, well, how many did you take? And I'm like, mm. And I disclosed, and they're like, oh my God. So the next thing I know, the police show up, and I am hysterically, like in absolute agony, sobbing my face off. I saw the police officers, and I fell to the ground, just absolutely shrieking in absolute emotional pain. And they could see that I was hurting, 
but they had nothing to say. They couldn't, they didn't know what to say. So instead of, you know, asking me what happened, right, you know, we don't, we don't like to hear what's wrong with you. It's what happened. Instead of asking me what happened, I was asked, are you going to hang yourself or are you going to shoot yourself? And I'm like, let's not be that dramatic. So they handed me a card to Highland Rivers and left. They left. So, for those of you who have adverse experiences with first responders, I'm here to tell you that even, if I, even though I am one, I have had those experiences myself. I have also been stigmatized. I have also been treated as crazy. I have also been put in positions that were not fair to someone who was clearly struggling. So, um, I'm going to end with that. <laughs> so, I'm going to speak to that for just a minute because I, I, I hate your story too. And I'm going to preface something with you because I think there is a little bit of a difference because I've walked through this. It's not necessarily that you're there to ask questions. That's what people always think. Well, I don't know what to say. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll get biblical because I am a pastor. Yeah. If you ever studied the, the, the book of Job, you know, Job went through this incredible, crazy losing everybody. And his friends came and sat with him, which was awesome, right up until they opened their mouths. That's when everything went downhill because then they just started accusing and doing all these other things. The thing that I think is the most powerful for somebody that's walking through a crisis is not that you're there to offer answers, but just that you're there. And Heather will attest, I've walked with her a lot of times when she's told me to go away. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's a public sidewalk. I can walk on it too. And so, um, try to push him off the curve. He's a lot stronger than he looks. But here's the thing is you can't be in that place to know what somebody needs if you're not already in their life. That's true. Because if you don't know somebody well, you don't know what they're doing or what they're looking for or what they need. And sometimes the people that are closest to you just need somebody to walk with you, sit with you, cry with you, hold you. Those are the most powerful moments. It's not what we say, it's what we do in those moments. And we're always looking for the right thing to say. That's not what we need. We just need you there looking for that, that opportunity to be present. And that's the only thing I would say to that. And yes, there are times where, no, you don't want to speak, you don't want anything, and sometimes you don't want anybody there, but sometimes it's nice to have somebody that's willing to just sit there. It's interesting. My husband's a Christian counselor, so we have a lot of very interesting um, discussions in my household. And um, again, the whole power of presence is, is very real. Um, and in my opinion, for me personally, it is, you had mentioned earlier about how you couldn't articulate the things that were going on. When someone is having a crisis, they cannot articulate. Why? Because the brain functions differently in crisis. So, especially for first responders, a lot of them don't understand or know or are educated on the fact that when someone is activated, they are in crisis, they are in survival mode, they can't articulate what's going on. And I've personally experienced been accused of being a liar because I couldn't articulate what was going on. And if it was any other time, any other place where I wasn't so activated, I could have a full-fledged conversation tell you what's going on. But in that moment, it is physically and neurologically impossible. I just want to throw this out there because there are some really well-meaning people in my life, in my past life too, that wanted to fix me. And uh, for the record, I asked Tina to excise the asthma out of my chest, not the demons. <laughs> Although I have had several churches that have tried to do that. We're, we're happy together. Please just leave them be. But one of the things I think is really important for caretakers to remember is the airline speech. Put your mask on before you put on somebody else's. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be able to be there for other people. But sometimes the best thing you can do is just be there with somebody. And if they tell you they don't want you there, sit outside their door and know that is not an invitation. But sometimes it's just you get to a place where you feel so completely isolated 
And I know from my experience, it's never just one thing. It's not, oh, gee, I'm having a bad day. I think I'll go in my life today. It doesn't work that way. And it's nobody's fault. It's a series of events that keep piling on top of each other until eventually you get to a place where you truly cannot see anything any other way out. And you're standing there at the edge of the precipice, and you are fighting every natural instinct that you have to stay alive because you honestly cannot see any way out. It's not about wanting to die. And for me, it wasn't even necessarily about wanting to end my pain as much as it was trying to end the pain of those around me. Because in my mind, I was causing all these problems and chaos and just creating all this, this stuff and making their lives miserable. And so if I wasn't there, then they wouldn't have to deal with it. And yeah, they'd probably be a little upset for a few days, and then they'd get really pissed off, and then they'd realize that they were better off without me. It's not a fun place to be. And if you have never been there, if you've never had suicidal thoughts, you, you can't understand what it, it feels like to have those intrusive thoughts in your head. If you've never sat there with a fistful of pills and trying to decide whether to swallow them, you don't understand what that feels like. And if you have never actively tried to take your own life, you will not understand what that feels like. And if you don't, I hope to hell you never do. And what's really scary, again, I know the statistics. Each time you have an attempt, the next attempt, you're going to up the ante. And the likelihood of it being completed goes up. I was told when I was in college that I would die by suicide before I turned 30. They were wrong, I was 32, so far I almost hit that point, just saying, but you know, I'm 31, almost 32. And now I'm 46, and I really want to go find that psych nurse and the nanny, nanny, baby, baby. Or you can you. Yeah. So I come at it from a, in another perspective. Um, my story is a little bit on the unique side in after he graduated school, um, he became a personal trainer, and he loved it. And I really thought that he had it down, and I didn't have to be proactive in his health care. He was over the age of 18, and unbeknownst to us, he had started to have a can't fall asleep and can't stay asleep problem. So instead of somebody diagnosing properly, sitting down and trying to find out do a blood test, for God's sake. We just forwarded him on. He went to a sleep doctor who started medicating. And by the time the first seven weeks were over, he had ingested over 15 different meds, along with antipsychotics, SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, and tricyclates. Um, and the doctor admitted that she was using them specifically for sleep. So the other part of everything that they're saying, there's another part to this. Medicine also brings on a whole host of problems. And when you have doctors that are misdiagnosing because unfortunately, mental illness and diagnosing, it is all based on hypothesis. If you meet these check boxes, then we guess that you're going to need this drug. That's, the, that's a really sad way of addressing our mental illness in this world today. But that's how they do it. And in our case, because he was over the age of 18, we had no idea what the doctor was giving him. She not only was giving him this stuff, she would do it over the telephone, and then she would have him alternate. These are the types of drugs you cannot alternate with. You just can't. And so we had a whole host of new behaviors going on that my husband and I were, were missing something. Something is not, not happening here. If the doctor was worth her weight, she would have recognized that there were problems and she would have referred him out, but she didn't. She decided that she was going to take hold of his care and continue to medicate. Uh, it got so bad that his withdrawal off of the host of drugs is the reason why he committed. Um, he did leave a two-page letter 
a lot of what he said in his two-page letter in your story and Heather, your story, I'm hearing almost verbatim a lot of the things he, he valued. Nobody valued him. He didn't think he was worth anything. What a terrible place to be at 22 years of age to feel like you have no value in this life. You do. And then as far as being the survivor of this, well, let me tell you something. This is a pain that is, there, this is undescribable. The death of a child is undescribable. The death of a child by suicide, there, there, there is nothing more painful. And as far as where people come, where they go, yeah, they all disappear. I might as well have had the plague because that's how people treated me. They didn't want to know. The minute they found out, oh, you're an SOS survivor, I don't really want to have anything to do with you. I, it's a terrible place to be. And sometimes you just need people to sit next to you and just, just be quiet, hold my hand. Hold my hand. But it's a very hard journey. And I always looked at it as you had two choices. You either picked yourself up or you died. And it's a very hard place to come back from a death of a suicide from a child. Well, that's a big one. Um, and thank you for that. And, and again, I agree. Uh, we don't have to be saviors. That's what we think. I don't know. You know, I've been a pastor for 29 years. Tina, you've been around for a while in this, and not nearly as long as me. You were just a little kid when I started. Uh, but, um, but that whole thing is, sometimes even as pastors, we feel like we have to be saviors, and we're not. So nobody's a savior. We're just got to be a good friend. And, and sit there. And it's not comfortable. Nobody likes it. And the reason we avoid it and the reason everybody goes away is because we don't know what to say and so we just avoid it. And so it's easier just to avoid it. And so that just perpetuates the problem. Now this is a panel we've kind of run with some things. Um, are there any questions that anybody out here, and that's really kind of my job and Haley. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to go back to Haley because I know a little bit of the story that you were talking about. But or at least I think I do. But talking about school counselors, talking about um, some of those things, oftentimes, and again, counselors, this goes for, for them, know when you're out of your depth and have people around you that you know you can talk to. As a pastor, it's again, I, I'm not anybody's savior. I counsel a lot of people, but I know when it's beyond what I can help with and who do I find that's why there was times we tried to help you find good medical doctors that would actually listen to you instead of just prescribe stuff. I remember when I was in school, eighth grade through high school, I didn't get sent to the principal's office. I got sent to the counselor's office. I, I would have rather been sent to the principal because the counselors were completely worthless. Now, granted, this was almost 30 years ago now. Because, you know, apparently I'm old, but it, it makes me wonder, because I know people, I worked as a CPS or a core agency. For those of you who don't know, core agencies take Medicare, Medicaid, not Medicare, Medicaid, like the different words are really hard. So they don't take private insurance. And a lot of the kids that they worked with were in the foster system and they would go into the schools because the school counselors weren't really equipped to handle a lot of this stuff. So things have changed mostly for the better. But it's just, it's important, like he said, to recognize if you're outside of your death. And, and much like Vicky said, drugs are not always the answer. Um, I, I have been over-medicated more than once. I have had a lot of really bad reactions to psych meds, especially the bipolar medication, because, you know, I'm bipolar, apparently. Also very narcissistic, in case you were wondering. Um, that was fun. Um, sorry, guys, I'm a little out of it tonight. 
But it is important to recognize that sometimes medication can help people, but it is a crapshoot, unfortunately. And for any of the providers out there, not just you, I know you're a provider, but anybody that happens to watch this, listen to your patients. <laughs> I know that's a novel idea, but when we tell you things, we're not making it up. When I told them that my cycle ended for 10 months and no, I wasn't pregnant, and they wouldn't believe me, and it, it never regulated after that, and that's been over 20 years now, well, close to 20 years. Uh, I've had elevated liver enzymes. I had a toxic lithium level, which there's a very small therapeutic window for lithium because they weren't monitoring it properly. And now, like, there are times when I question whether or not medication would help with some of the fun that is my life, but I am very hesitant to attempt it again because of all the negative effects. And quite frankly, I don't think there's many that they haven't tried yet. Kind of like the diagnosis. I'm pretty sure next time we get an assessment, it's going to be a prostate issue because they run out of everything else. Hey, where are you? You scare me every time. Um, and this is kind of not really a question, but like something that I struggle with. <laughs> something that I struggle with is um, being afraid of like dying, but also being afraid of living. And I just, I guess my question is, what would you say to someone who had just told you that? It's <laughs> a great question. Well. True therapist passion, I'd probably answer your question with a question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but no, because I, I would want to know, like, what, tell me more. Like, what do you mean by that exactly? Cause I, like, I, certainly I would be like, oh, this sounds quite serious, you know, but I would also hate to assume that I know necessarily what you mean or why you say that. Good. I'd also tell you that God loves you and you're important and yeah there's more things that need to be asked but first and foremost you're important and you need to stay and know that God loves you. I'm going to take Larry's position because he hasn't asked us yet and it needs to be asked. Okay. Because I, I know from my experience what it's like to be on the receiving end of a call. And I want to believe that things have, been, have started changing and that they're getting more training, but specifically words, uh, the, the crisis and side of this. With the new 988 number, what is the new, the new process and is it always going to lead to being hospitalized? Such a good question. I thought. All right. So in 988, all right, um, 988, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like the 911, but for mental health crisis. This bypasses having to call law enforcement if they are not needed. Similarly to if you don't have a medical emergency, it will bypass having EMS come as well. But 988 will connect you with either a licensed or certified professional. They can come out to your house, okay? So if you've ever experienced being in paper scrubs, sitting in the ER for however many hours or days at a time, this will bypass that as well. You don't have to go sit in the ER. They can come to you, evaluate you, and then also find you somewhere to go if you so choose, or if you know, assuming that you're not 1013. But um, that is kind of how 988 works. It bypasses all of the law enforcement and the ER and <laughs> medical needs if they're not needed. Um, now, of course, if 988 is called and they show up and they do deem it necessary for them to be there, they will have them come out and assist. But it's, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the other thing that can happen is that in the event that you do need law enforcement or EMS or fire or whatever your issue may be, um, always ask for a crisis intervention officer. Um, I personally am working to bring more CIT officers to EMS because in legislative advocacy we are trying to synonymize medical health and mental health. And, and from my own personal experience, when you're having a mental health crisis and the police show up, you're like, oh crap, I'm going to go to jail. I'm being punished for asking for help. I'm being punished because I can't do it anymore. So those are some of the updates. Um, that have happened. 
To be fair, when you're thrown in paper scrubs and stuck in a fishbowl, it really does feel like you're being punished. It does. Um, that was that was my experience. Um, so after my attempt, um, I attempted to go to work and pretend that nothing happened. So I showed up at work in uniform, ready to go about my day like nothing happened the day before. Um, I had to stand in a room full of my entire command staff, all men, and try to explain to them what was going on with me. So to kind of set the scene for you, I was 26 years old. And I had learned at the age of 26, for the first time in my life, that I had spent 21 years of my life in domestic violence. I had no idea. Thought it was all normal. I was born into layers upon layers of generational trauma, and I had no clue. So when we talk about grief, the stages of grief, it is not just for death. Grief can be for anything. The things that happened, the things that didn't happen, the people that were there, the people that were not there. Simultaneously, after learning this, I went through what was called, what I call the spiral. And what I call the spiral, it was a series of events of things about life. You know, things that we normally go through, except I had nine different traumatic experiences happen within one year's time frame. In addition to that, I was pregnant and then had that child prematurely. So let's throw in postpartum depression. Oof. And that's what did it for me. So when I showed up in uniform to the ER and I'm like, hey, I was told to come here for, for a mental evaluation. They're like, okay. So I go in the room, and it was a tiny little room, almost like a cell, and I watched the clock, and I spoke for exactly 90 minutes. And by the time I was done, the nurse practitioner said, there is no doctor that will risk his license to let you go home. And I had an absolute meltdown, as you could assume. And they made me change out of my uniform, put me in paper scrubs, and I sat there in a room by myself with not even a TV for over six hours. I had no one to come in and explain to me what the process was what to expect. I had never been hospitalized. I had never attempted suicide before. This was all brand new to me. And so you could, you could safely speculate that that in and of itself was yet another trauma that I had to go through. Now, I've mentioned earlier um, that I've also experienced adverse experiences with first responders. I am here to tell you there are those of us who work in the first responder field that are very passionate about this stuff. What the general public finds, um, or maybe misunderstands, is that we are not different. We still have addicted partners. We have mentally ill families. We go through trauma just as the average person does. We are just held to a different standard. And that, I call it the trash can effect. You know, when you build up everything in your trash can, you push it down, you got a little bit, little bit of space. And then you push it down some more, and you got a little more space, but eventually you can't push it down anymore. And you got to take that trash out. And then that's where compassion fatigue can happen, where you have the adverse experiences, where they accuse you of being attention-seeking, or they accuse you of lying, or not knowing what you're talking about, or whatever, an inconvenience. Again, projection is real, OK? How someone treats you says way more about what they got going on than you. And I understand, and I wholeheartedly understand, that that isn't always easy to see in the moment, but it is something to consider after the fact. So I will say this, um, I'm a chaplain with Kennesaw Police Department, so I deal a lot with them. And we've, Heather's done a lot with uh, Kennesaw Police to help them have a better understanding. So a police officer, if they're dispatched to uh, a crisis, especially, you mentioned CIT trains, crisis intervention training. Most of the officers in Kennesaw have been given that, but an officer, when they walk into a situation, this is something that we helped Heather with, they're, they're, they've got two objectives. One is to secure whatever's going on and to take control of that scene. The way that they do that is very forcefully. Loud commands, very much, and when somebody's in a crisis moment, like Heather has been many times, becomes nonverbal, starts to have tics, things like that to come out, an officer doesn't know how to do that, so oftentimes they will end up in handcuffs until somebody can come along and help. They're really trying to change that. They're, that's what the crisis intervention training is designed to do, is to teach the officers how to deal with those situations to recognize that this is something besides a situation that we have to take control of by force. But that's the disconnect. And you're right, there is a lot of trauma in our officers' lives, but they're getting better training for Heather, we have a little, we had an officer help her put a card together. 
she carries in her wallet so that if she's ever in a place where she can't verbally speak, she can hand that card to him that explains what goes on in her life, what's going on, who to call, and how to get help. And I've had more than one phone call from an officer saying, hey, I've got Heather here. She's not saying anything, but your number's on here. What can you do? And I've walked them through how to help her through that situation. That didn't end in handcuffs, ended in, okay, we've de-escalated. Now we can go on our way. Yes, um, there are, uh, I'm sure a lot of us in this room are familiar with like the medical alert tags for like diabetes and such. They have wristbands for CIT and on the, on the um, underside it has medical alert or mental health alert on it. And so those are a pretty good indicator that like, hey, if I see this, I'm going to ask, do you have an advanced psychiatric directive? I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's a piece of legislation that was passed last year in 2023. It is essentially a document that is to be gone over while someone is well, as in not in crisis. And it's to be gone over with someone, either their therapist, counselor, or even a peer specialist. And it goes over what this diagnosis is. What, do you, what diagnosis do you live with? What medications do you take? What medications you don't take? Who to contact, who not to contact? Who their treatment team is? what hospital to take them to that they may have a decent rapport with. This is a how to deal with this situation for the responding officer. Now again, it is very brand new. A lot of agencies still don't know about it yet, but in part of my work is to um, explain this piece of legislation and I equip every single person, either someone that I see for counseling or first responders, I will give them a copy of the advanced psychiatric directive so that they at least see it and are familiar with it. So that's another update. As Larry said, we've been working on me overcoming my fear of first responders because of a lot of bad experiences in the past. And I recently, I think it was last year, the cops night, national night out, I actually took the time to overcome my fear, sort of, and talk with a first responder. And he told me one of the things that you can do is get a hold of your local dispatch area give them your whatever pertinent information that they need to have that will only go out if a call is called out for you. One of the major triggers for me, and he knows this, is sirens. I will freak out completely if I hear sirens. And I can be relatively calm, but if they start coming down the road in a police or fire or ambulance, you're going to see me freak out pretty quickly, especially if I'm already in a crisis situation. So it's just some, I don't know how to go about doing it because I've slept once or twice in some, but it is another resource and the card that I carry in my wallet. I even had a separate one for Dragon Con this year because Dragon Con is amazing and awesome, but it's also very, very overwhelming. And I had my own protocol set up so that if I had any problems, so if you're going into situations or you know you're going to be in a stressful place, or if you know that you deal with some of this stuff, having things like that available that people can get to, especially emergency people, it really does make a difference. Cool. I want to circle this back around because we've had a really long discussion. Is there anything out here? Because we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, anything you want to ask one of the panel members? Uh, any questions that you might have? I don't know. Uh, anybody else? We've had just a couple. Because I have a place I want to go to wrap up and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask those questions. Um, cool. So here's where I think as we kind of wrap this up, there's, there's two different questions that I have that are kind of similar. Um, for those of us that are parent, a friend, um, and we're walking with somebody. We've talked about a lot of the signs. We've, walked, we've talked about a lot of the things that are going on. What are some things that we can do to identify some of these things and maybe to give the right kind of help if it's just sitting and walking? What are just some basic recommendations that you have for us that are on this side? Maybe we're getting phone calls. Maybe we have friends, neighbors, whoever that may be that we see struggling. And then the other side of that question is, for those that are struggling, what words would you have for them in this moment that maybe they're feeling those, those feelings? Because I think everybody's story is a little bit different. You've heard a lot of the same things that happened. 
you know, in Heather's story, and, and you're hearing these same things come up. But, you know, I still don't know. My brother was in his 40s. I, we still have no idea. He never left a note, didn't leave anything, just went, locked himself in his shed, turned on his motorcycle, sat down, and died. So we don't, we have speculation. I think everybody comes to that point in a different place. Some stories, there's gonna be some similarities, but I think everybody gets to that place different. Our, our stories are all different, um, even though there's some similarities. So what, you hear kind of two sides to that. There's the side to those of us that are walking alongside others, and then those that may be struggling themselves. You can answer either one of those however you want to, but our, our panel members, where, where would you go? Yeah, um, I'll speak more so to the first one. I think that um, empathy is huge. That's, I think, a great starting point. Um, be a safe space for somebody to talk to you if they decide to. Um, if they don't want to talk, be a safe place for them to sit next to you. Um, especially like in grief, you know, just sitting with somebody in grief is huge. Um, loss, hopelessness, you know, just that, that kind of visual symbol that you're not alone. I don't know how to help, I don't know what to say to make it better, but you're not alone, I'm here sitting next to you. So um, just listening so that there's an open door to the conversation for somebody who is struggling. Um, and then the other thing I would say too is like, ask, you know, ask, tell me one thing I can do that will help you. What's one way I can support you? Rather than kind of the open end, like, I'm here if you need me, you know, is there anything that I can do for you? It's hard for people to say, well, yes, actually. But you say, like, please tell me one way I can help you. Um, that opens the conversation up a bit more. From the recovery side of it, um, I think I'm an advocate for bringing people materials, books, brief, learning. There's actually an SOS guide that's out there that's very, very, very beneficial because when you're the recipient of it, you don't even know who you are, your name. You recognize that your feet are touching the ground, but you feel nothing. You're in a state of shock. So you don't know what to ask for a lot of the times. So I'm a great advocate about bringing, finding out what products are out there and bringing somebody, go visit somebody with a bag of something and say, here, this is what I want to do for you. Leave it behind. At least it puts a notion that when they don't know what to do, they can reach in that bag and see something. Hope, encouragement. And that's, um, I'm an advocate for that. I'm a firm believer that healing is found in community. And so I would say when you're not in crisis, build a strong um, support system in your life that you have already in place. Because when you are in crisis, you're not going to be able to, to build that. You need to have those things in place in your life. Two years ago, my life changed radically, and not one thing is the same today as it was 24 months ago. Had I not had strong community surrounding me in my life, I, I'm not sure where I would be today. So it it's so important to build that strong community of people around you. And that doesn't mean you gotta have a thousand people. I mean, your community and your, your circle of support might be three people, it might be one person, it might be five people, who knows. But um, I think that healing is found in community. And so when we are in crisis, we have people we can turn to who will be there for us and just sit with us and not always feel like they have to have the answer. Sometimes you just want people to sit with you, you know. And so um, I just I just think community is a, is a big part of what we have to have in our lives. Because Jesus didn't make us to live life alone. He didn't make us to be islands unto ourselves. And so we have to, we have to be willing, um, whether we're introvert or extrovert, we have to be willing to invite people into our circle and, you know, create that community of trust in our lives. Yeah, I agree. I think that's huge. Um, you also said, like, when you're not in crisis. Um, I, back on the table there, I have a suicide and safety plan that's, you know, if you know that you struggle with that, it's good to create that when you're not in crisis. And it, 
It does. You can probably very familiar with them, right? <laughs> um, yeah, they like to make you feel about when you're in the hospital. Yeah. That's, that, that's great. Right, 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 yeah. So, like, when you are doing better, um, it does help you list, like, who are my community members? Who are my support people? Let me list them out. Let me put their names down, their numbers down. Where are places that I can go that, like, bring me some peace or self-soothing? What are things I can do by myself? What are things that I can do for other people? And so, like, post that up somewhere. Fill it out. Post it up somewhere because you can't think of these things when you are going through something. Like, you, it helps to have it physically you know, written down somewhere where you can see it and not have to think about it yourself. I've been thinking about this way too much, and I'm going to try to answer both questions. The first thing through your eyes, and this is true of uh, any situation with another individual, because unfortunately we are built to be in community and it really kind of sucks. <laughs> I'm a loner. And I, I need my downtime, but sometimes being alone gets very lonely. The greatest thing you can give to anybody is the only non-renewable resource, and that is your time. So don't waste your time by asking people what they need or what they want, because with, it, they're probably not going to be able to tell you. So instead of asking an open-ended question like that, you can instead say, hey, when's the, la when's the last time you ate? You want me to fix you something to eat? Hey, when's the last time you got in the shower? Maybe we should try you know, getting your hair washed because that can make a huge difference. Bring them meals. Like I said, if they don't want to be around you, say, okay, well, I'm going to sit right out here until you're ready because you need to meet people where they're at. That, that's the first thing. And on the flip side of this, if you are someone who is struggling, I'm going to tell you the things that I wish people had told me. And there have been times people probably have told me this, but my brain is out at the moment. It's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. Because all too often we try to push away those bad feelings or those painful feelings and people in our society want you to be happy and joyful and yay! And that's not reality. So it's okay to feel whatever you need to feel. If you are going through grief and they talk about the five stages, well, I think it's a lot of inappropriate word goes here. Because grief doesn't go away. Some days it's easier than others, but it's always going to be there because that whether it's because you lost somebody that you care about or you lost something that was important to you. Last year I had both knees replaced and that the hardest part of the recovery was not the physical side, it was the mental side. And the loss of mobility and I'm doing better now but I'm still not as far along as I thought it would be. And that's very, very difficult for me. So just remind people that it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. Feelings, you can't control what you feel. You can control how you respond to how you feel. And the other thing I, I would want people to realize is that as long as you still have breath, you still have hope. And I don't say that easily because hope is something that scares me. And it's, it's one of those things that people throw out there like, oh, you know, just hold on to that hope. Well, here's the problem with hope. If you don't have a safety net underneath that hope, when that hope goes away, everything else goes along with it. That is largely why I took the physical pills. Because I was at a place where I just, I had been hoping that he was going to make it. I had been begging God to spare his life. He was only a week shy of 19 months, not years, months old. And just shy of two years ago, I lost Max, who was my baby boy. He, he's the one that saved me after T-Bone. And even though he was 12 years old, it still devastated me. And that's something that, that, that's never going to go away. That pain is always going to be there. And when people tell me to just get over it, it doesn't help. So it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. I think that's the biggest thing. I just have two quick things to add. Um, 
There's a misconception that all suicide attempts are planned. That someone, you know, they felt this way for a while. That wasn't the case for me. For me, it was impulsive. It wasn't that I wanted to die. I just wanted everything to just stop. I could not take anything else. And that's, I don't feel like that particular experience is talked about enough because we always hear about, oh, someone left a note or, you know, we saw them give their stuff away or whatever. But in my case, it was very impulsive. Now, you mentioned being a loner. I am also a loner. We talk about social circles. I have a triangle. And sometimes my triangle isn't always available. So I use the peer-to-peer -peer warm line. It's, it's in here. I personally use this when I have to, even as a professional. Why? Because I'm a cumulative trauma survivor. I don't trust people, you know? And what I love about the warm line is not only did I used to work with the warm line, so I used to be the voice on the warm line. And more often than not, because I'm still very much associated with the network, um, I usually end up talking to someone that I'm familiar with, which is vastly beneficial to me personally. But what I love about the warm line is that it's available 24-7. Doesn't matter what day of the week or a holiday, doesn't matter. But it's also confidential. I don't have to worry about me expressing myself and then hearing about it down the street somewhere or seeing some subliminal Facebook post about something that I shared. You know, and so for me, that gives me a sense of security because I don't trust people. That's why I have a triangle, not a circle. But nonetheless, at least I have a triangle, right? So. I just want to speak to that because a lot of people think that suicide attempts are which honestly they usually aren't they are the act itself tends to be very impulsive but it is not an impulsive act you don't just decide okay well I'm done living you have all this cumulative crap that comes up and then in that moment that's the only thing that makes sense so the act itself is impulsive but it is not an impulsive act it's also not a coward's way out, it's not a selfish thing, because again, in your mind, or at least in my mind, and you can speak to this as well, I don't think you were doing it to get even with people. I wasn't. I truly believe that people would be happier with me not around. And so when we talk about things like that, and one of the biggest frustrations for me is words. Not only because they're hard, but because they're often misused. People love to use the word suffering with mental illness. I don't suffer, I struggle. Suffering means that I'm allowing it to happen and I'm a willing participant. And there are times that yes, I have suffered. That's usually when I get to that point where, okay, well, life's done, because I don't see any way out. Struggling means that I am actively working to improve my situation. Another one that really bothers me is when people use the word committed suicide. And there's a history behind that. Most people do not realize this, but it used to be a crime to try to kill yourself. Which, I mean, honestly, it might as well still be the way they treat you. I'm pretty sure you have more rights in prison than you do in a mental hospital. And I'm not being entirely sarcastic when I say that. When you are experiencing a mental health crisis, they strip you out of your clothes and they put you in paper scrubs, and then they stick you in a room where they have a guard posted outside watching you, but nobody talks to you. The last time I was in there, I started having an asthma attack, and all I needed was my inhaler, which took forever for them to give it to me, and by the time it did, they had already ordered the respiratory therapist to come up and give me a breathing treatment. I hate breathing treatments, especially albuterol, because I will literally shake and twitch for hours afterwards. By the time the RT came up to the room, I was out of the respiratory distress, She's like, well, you don't really seem to need it anymore. Do you want to do this? I'm like, not really. She's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll chart that you were non-compliant. And I'm like, nope. Because I knew that if that non-compliance was on there, I was not getting out of there. So I just want you guys to think about the words that you use and the way that you describe things and the way that you talk about things. Another really frustrating thing for me is a, a lot of people in the suicide loss world ref, only refute, re, refer to survivors as people that have lost someone to suicide. They refer to people who have attempted and survived their attempt as attempters. By golly, next time you'll get it right. I am a survivor. 
Morgan is a survivor. Vicky is a survivor. Larry is a survivor. And I'm sure there's others in this room too. It doesn't matter if you were the one that tried to take your life and you survived that attempt or if you lost somebody and survived. We're all survivors. And we all have a story that is valuable and needs to be shared. All right. Um, thank you guys. Panel members, thank you so much for everything you've given us. And it's, it only scratches the surface. Um, we are out of time. I'm going to point to a table in the back. There's um, a lot of information. We have some over here. We have some at the back. Um, explain NAMI for me. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It is the largest grassroots mental health organization in the country. This is an organization that is founded by peers, those who live with mental health challenges as well as their families. Um, they do a lot with education, support, and advocacy. Um, I am a representative of NAMI Georgia, NAMI Hall County, and NAMI Gilmer. Um, I run the Frontline Wellness Chapter of NAMI, um, but I'm also a Connection Support Group Facilitator. So I do a lot of work with the general public and first responders, but I do not mix them. They are two totally different communities. So Frontline Wellness is specific to first responders and hospital staff, but um, NAMI connection groups and educational things are available free of charge to anyone and everyone who would like to have an or a presentation or needs a support group or has interest in advocacy. Um, advocacy, you know, the Advanced Psychiatric Directive, that was a direct result of, of legislative advocacy. And that is something that NAMI stands for as well. Cool. Thank you very much. There's a lot of great resources. Um, so use those. Um, I'm going to say just two more things. Heather and I do a podcast called 412 Connections that's all around how mental health and every part of our lives are connected. And we've had different people. Tina's been on our, our podcast before, so we do everything from health to diet to community, all of those things and how they're connected to our mental health and how we can stay mental health. So 412 Connections, if you ever want to look that up, it's found pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts. If you go to the table the, with the green, that's that color, green tablecloth, there are copies of the brochure or there are copies of my business card. Both of them have QR codes that will take you directly to the podcast. Yeah. Um, the audio from this will be in tomorrow's episode and then Larry and I am hoping Deanna will be our guest. We'll be doing a second episode because they come out the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month, largely because I don't want to do a weekly podcast. <laughs> no. So with that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. Heather would would never say this. This is Heather's brainchild. She really has a passion about this. It's our fourth one in May. We do one that's more of uh, I don't even know how you would describe May, but. But we talk about mental health because that's Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we bring in artwork and do a lot around that. So we do twice, two of these a year. Most of what happens here comes out of her pocket. She pays for it. She even pays for the video. So if you feel inclined, there's a bag back there. You can leave a donation to help offset some of those costs. It's a passion of hers. She didn't ask me to say that. I'm saying that. So um, these guys are up here as volunteers coming to share because they're passionate about it. Thank them for being here. There's some artwork you can check out. Stay, hang out for a little bit. We'll kick you out when we need to get you out. But uh, thank you for being here today. All right, great job, guys.